the book of James. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to turn. We are, uh, we've arrived at James chapter 2. And so uh, if you want to turn to James, James chapter 2. Uh, while you're turning there, let me just say last month we, uh, we gave you an opportunity just to say thank you to our staff and myself. And on behalf of our staff, thank you to all of, those, all of you who blessed us. Uh, it's not lost on us, and it is very much appreciated. So thank you for your generosity and your gifts. Uh, James chapter 2, uh, just a quick uh, review. You can go back and watch previous messages if you like. But uh, we looked at James chapter 1. We talked about temptations and trials and how God uses trials that we go through to strengthen us and strengthen our faith. And also we... we uh, laid the groundwork that God does not tempt us to sin, that that is our enemy or our flesh. But uh, in that message, I gave you a four-point battle plan to win the battle over temptation, so you can go back and check that out. Um, then we looked at uh, the rest of chapter 1, and, we, and James talks about hearing and doing, not just being a hearer, but also a doer. Although doing doesn't save us, we hear and by faith we're saved, but then we should be, we should get to work. And so we talked about that some, hearing and doing and we talk, he talks about what real Christianity looks like. And, and so coming off of chapter 1 and into chapter 2 today, he's kind of still hitting that vein. What does real Christianity look like? And so we're going to continue with that thought in James chapter 2. Let's start reading with verse 1. The text says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, Will you stand over there or you sit at my feet? Verse 4. Have you not made, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Today we're going to center around the idea of judgment and mercy. And so uh, let's just ask the Lord to speak to us through his word today and through preaching. If you will, bow your heads and let's pray. Father, we invite, we ask the Holy Spirit to come and to speak to us. Quicken our spirits, Holy Spirit, to, to see what you see, to hear what you're saying, and then to do what you've commanded. But when we go to do it, Father, don't let us do it out of a begrudging obligation. Father, let us do it with joyful obedience. Because we know that our good set Father and Savior, King Jesus, has good things that await for those who, who walk in joyful obedience to his word. Change us today by your word and by your presence. Let the interaction of the word and the Holy Spirit find a place in our heart that changes us to become more like you, Jesus. We ask this in your name. And let the church say amen. Amen. Well, the big idea today from James 2, I preach from this text, and uh, I'm so thankful that I feel like New Covenant does a really good job uh, with this kind of thing, but we're going to, I want to dive a little bit deeper into it and not just talk about the what, because we've talked about the what, and James actually tells us what. He's, he's saying, don't be partial. Don't, don't prefer one person because they've got it going on over a, somebody else who doesn't necessarily have it going on. That's, that's pretty practical and helpful. And thanks be to God, you, church, you do a pretty good job of this. And so I'm, I'm so honored to pastor you because you do a good job. But I don't want to just, I want to dig a little deeper beyond just the what and look into the why. Like, like why does this matter? Why does this matter to God? And so we're going to look into that. And, and to be honest, if, if you're a person in your Christian walk who has, who has experienced the, the mercy of God, like if, you, if you're the kind of Christian who you are fully aware today that 
You're not saved because of your own goodness or your own morality. You know that your morality did not rescue you from hell, that it was only, it was purely, it was solely the goodness and the mercy of God that afforded you your salvation, then you're going to get today. Like, you're, you're going to get it. I promise you, you'll get this message. It won't be hard for you. However, if you're kind of the kind of Christian that you call yourself a Christian because you're a good moral person and you've never committed any huge sins and compared to, you know, that person and to that person, you're not so bad. If the basis of your Christianity is on your own morality, then today you're probably going to be challenged. You might even be offended today. Maybe the Lord will change you. <laughs> So James starts off in today's text, and he says, show no partiality. So let's, let's dive into that for a minute. James is describing an ungodly attitude that we can have towards others. He says, show no partiality. The thing that I, I love the fact that he says partiality because there are, there are two sides to this attitude. Uh, the, the negative side that I think we have commonly dealt with in our culture is the side of discrimination. Discrimination is one side of this attitude. Discrimination is a bias against somebody. You are excluding somebody based on a bias. We all know what discrimination is. We, we even have laws against discrimination. Like that's how against that we are. Like we, we, we've created and passed laws that say you cannot do that. You've got to be fair. You've got to be equal. So, so, so we're not allowed to, and we, and we get, like, it's socially acceptable in our culture to not discriminate based on a bias. However, that's not what James said. What did James say? He said, show no partiality. Partiality is the other side of this attitude. It's kind of the, it's kind of the positive side, if you will, of, of this ungodly attitude. It's the same ungodly attitude. It's just the side that is acceptable in our culture. We don't, we don't discriminate, but we will be partial. It's the same thing. And I love that James didn't say don't discriminate. He said show no partiality. Partiality is a bias for someone. It's, it's including someone based on a bias. But how many of you know, anytime you include someone based on a bias, you are simultaneously excluding someone based on that same bias. So James says, show no partiality. We get discrimination, but par being partial is acceptable in our culture. I mean, come on. You know there's people that are just difficult, right? Right? There's those people that it's just hard to do life. It's hard to do life with. It's hard to be around them. And so what's the tendency? Well, let's get over here around some people that doing life with is a little easier. It's a little more fun to be around these people. Like that's in, 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 in our social construct, discrimination is a big no-no. But partiality is, that's eh, okay. What does James say? Show no partiality. And so let's dig into the why. Because I think, here's, here's what I think. And it seems like the Holy Spirit in, in such a beautiful and powerful way has been given to us, not to just give us goosebumps in a church service or make us feel good when we're down, but there's this aspect of the Holy Spirit that when something's not right, when the gospel's not having its full effect in your life, when, when you're not letting Jesus into every nook and cranny in your soul, the Holy Spirit just kind of goes, and he will not leave you alone until you let him in and you get that right. And so I feel like sometimes this is one of those places where the Holy Spirit is just nudging and He's talking and he's whispering. 
Because we, we, love, we love our own little favorite tribes. That's natural. That's human. We, we, let me get with my people, my group, my tribe. My, you know, that's, so, that's so natural. But God's called us to be supernatural. And so he's, he's pushing us to step out of our little groups and step out of our little tribes and step, up, step out of our little favorite groups and, and do life and, and mingle and mix up our lives with people who aren't like us. And if I can encourage you at all, let me tell you something. It's a wonderful journey if you just embrace it. Like it is so, life is so boring if your friend groups, if all of your friends look like you. Man, don't live such a boring life. Is everybody looking like you, living in the same kind of neighborhood, the same tax bracket, the, the, the same vacation? How boring is that? But step across the lines of race, step across the lines of economics, step across the lines of neighborhood, and just get to know some people and learn some people and, and share their experience. Man, that's an that's a exciting journey, and that's the journey the Holy Spirit is nudging us into. He says, don't be partial. Step into some spaces. Yeah, you're going to feel a little awkward, a little weird, but it's okay. I'll go with you, and you'll learn some stuff. He'll stretch your heart, and he'll expand your borders and your territory and cause you to live a life that's worth something. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the, the why. Like, like, why is he saying that? Can't we just do our thing and be with our people and just, just leave us alone? Let's talk about the why. Because the why is going to show us why it matters. Let's uh, skip down to verse 8 in James 2. James says, if you, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, in other words, if you do what Jesus said, you remember what Jesus said, look, let's boil it down, let's make it simple, let's make it easy. When he was asked, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what James was referring to. He said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, look, you're doing well. If you're loving your neighbor as yourself, good job. He said, you're doing a good job. But here comes verse 9. But if you show partiality, listen to what he says. Like, he's not pulling punches here. He's pulling out the big guns. If you show partiality, you're committing sin. Wow. Wow. And you're convicted by the law as transgressors. Listen, he's, got, he's just going to keep pulling on us. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. So this is why this matters. This doesn't matter because God wants to use us to help all of the disenfranchised and all the poor people in our community. This, is, this doesn't matter for them. It matters for us. It matters, for, it matters to get us right. It, this has to do with us, not them. This doesn't have to do with all the people that we could potentially be partial to. This has to do with us. I want to read a quote to you from the late Tim Keller. He said it so, uh, so powerfully. He says this, A merely religious person who believes God will favor him because of his morality and respectability will ordinarily have contempt for the outcast. I worked hard to get where I am, and so can anyone else, is what they say. However, I am, the, I am only where I am by the sheer and unmerited mercy of God. I am completely equal with all other people. That is the language of the Christian heart. So when I, when I asked if you see yourself as, as, as one who is saved on your own merit, on your own goodness, or it was totally, purely, solely on the mercy and the goodness of God, that's why it matters. Because how you see your own salvation affects how you treat other people. Because, look, here, if you're looking around the room here today and you go, look, Pastor, I get you, but listen, I got it going on. I mean, I got it together. I mean, you're, you're talking to them. I mean, I look around this room, 
I grew up a Christian, grew up in a Christian home, never done any bad stuff. Ten Commandments, all my life. I'm probably in the top, top 5% of wage earners in this room. Got a successful job, successful business. Kids are doing great, making good grades. You're not talking to me. Well, Mr. Top 5%, let me just ask you one thing. Where's your fruit? How many people are in the kingdom of God today because of you? How many disciples are you making today? Furthermore, how do you think you got to where you are? How do, how do you think you stepped into all of that awesomeness? It wasn't you. Your failure to acknowledge where your blessings come from does not negate the source. It was God and only God. It was God who opened the door for you to have that job that you think you deserve. It was God who gave you breath in your lungs to wake up this morning. It was God who even given you a sound mind to have the ability to think straight. So it wasn't you. It was God. It's always been him. I thought about this, so uh, I'm old enough to tell these old stories that kids don't get, and I love it. It's just, it fits me real good. I love these, telling these stories. And so when we were kids, this was before we had um, such a choice of organized sports. We, we had organized sports. I'm not that old, but not as many. You know what I'm saying? Like, there wasn't, like, travel ball and this and that, like, you know, so... And, and many of y'all remember this. You would, uh, you would do a pickup game, a football in somebody's yard, basketball pickup game. All the kids in the neighborhood would come around, play a pickup game, baseball down at the city park. We, you know, we did this. Kids are looking like, what do we do? How do we, how do we create this social construct? How do you pick teams? You know, look, we just figured it out. We just showed up and we started doing it. And you know how it, you know how it goes down. Guys, this is how this goes down. You can Google it. How to pick teams for pickup games. <laughs> the two most talented athletes, they have to be the captains, right? Because you don't, you, they cannot be on the same team. Or it's not fair, no fun, no competition. So the two most talented athletes have to be the captains. And then it's their job to pick the teams. Of course, when they start picking, everybody knows who gets picked first and everybody also knows, including the ones who get picked last, who's going to get picked last. That's just the way it is. And we're all okay with it. We all know. And then everybody else is in the middle, you know, but we know who's first and we know who's last, even the ones that get picked. And that's, that's how it went down. And then we played, and hopefully the captains did a good job of picking competitive teams so the game was fun. If the game was lopsided, what do we do? Gather up, repick teams. This was no fun. Yeah. So that, that's, how it, that's how we played sports as kids. But that process of picking the best first is the opposite of what the gospel teaches us. As a matter of fact, the problem I see with us is as Christian adults, we're still like kids on the playground picking teams and we go through our entire lives trying to pick the best ones first and James is telling us no that's not the gospel that's not what Jesus is trying to teach you to do listen just take a glance at the scriptures that's not how God does it God doesn't pick the best first to be on his team as a matter of fact you look at God picks Moses a stammering murderer to go to the ruler of Egypt and to walk up to him toe-to-toe -to -toe and say, uh, uh, God said, uh, after uh, uh, 400 years, uh, uh, let my people go. <laughs> what? First of all, Moses is not qualified. He's got a past and he can't talk good. And then you're just going to send him right up in there to just say, let my people go. Like, that's going to work, and God's like, yes. Amen. 
That's exactly what he did. God doesn't pick the best. He doesn't pick the most qualified. And he picks the unqualified. And he picks the last choice. And he sends them on impossible missions for the glory of his name. Look at Gideon. Gideon the scripture says Gideon, that he was, he was a member of the, of the weakest tribe in Israel. His family was the, 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 the least significant family in that tribe. And he was the most insignificant person in his family. God looks down on the earth and he says, who should I lead the charge against the Midianites? You. You're, you're the most unqualified. You're my pick. And he calls Gideon to lead Israel's army against the Midianites. That's how God does it. Look at David. David, Jesse has all these boys, all these strapping, strong men who are enlisted men in Israel's army. It comes time for the prophet to pick the next king of Israel. Jesse parades all of his boys except David before the prophet. And the prophet says, nope. He's not the one, he's not the one, he's not the one, and on and on until he looks at Jesse and he says, do you got any more? Because I don't see the anointing on any of these guys. And Jesse goes, well, I do have this one kid, but, you know, he's, he's a little misguided. He's probably out in the field playing a harp. I just stuck him out there to keep the sheep. Who was he? He was God's choice. The last pick of the bunch. God's perfect man yeah, yeah. to not only kill Goliath, but to expand Israel's borders, to take territory from the Philistines and secure her borders, to establish the city of Jerusalem. David became Israel's greatest king, yeah. the most uns- insignificant, the least qualified of them all. God does not pick teams like we pick teams. Yeah, yeah. He chose Esther, a Hebrew woman, a Hebrew refugee, Picked her, unqualified, unsuspecting, raised her up and said, I want you to go before the king and say, let all of your people go. Sound familiar? Esther's like, well, (laughs) let's fast and let's pray. And if I live to see the sunrise, then good job. And she goes before the king of Persia and God rescues his people using a Hebrew female refugee. So unqualified. But that's how God picks his teams. Look at Saul in the New Testament. Saul persecuted the church, serving papers on followers of Jesus, locking them up in prisons. And Jesus meets Saul one day and says, I choose you. I choose you to write a majority of the New Testament. I choose you to take the gospel to the Gentiles. I choose you to preach the message across the Mediterranean realm. I choose you. Listen, we know God doesn't pick the most qualified because I'm here. And because you're here. Amen. Amen. He didn't pick the best. He didn't pick the prettiest. He didn't pick the most. He didn't pick the richest. He didn't pick the most influential. He didn't pick the most popular. Paul says it like this. He chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly and despised things of this world so that no one can boast. The reason we don't show partiality to others is because God did not show partiality to us. That's why. He chose me when I was not qualified. He picked me when I didn't deserve it. And when the grace of God rolls over your heart and you realize that you have that what you don't deserve, things that you didn't earn, things that you don't qualify for, but God picks you and raises you up and sets you up, then you have no place to be partial to other people. All you can do is show the same mercy you've been given. All you can do is show the same grace that you've been given. That's why it matters. And so it not only works that way, it works both ways, and, and, and I will uh, confess to you, I've shared this in some of our groups that we've had, uh, but God is, he's working on me in this area, uh, but, but there is a group of people that I have a problem with, and I've made it known publicly, and I'm going to do so again here, but there are days when I go down Millage Avenue, and I pass the frat houses, and I see all the boys on the 
front lawn and all the red solo cups scattered across the ground. Most of them are white boys like myself. And I see that scene. And boy, it just gets under my skin so bad. Because all I can think in my mind is you bunch of spoiled, overprivileged boys away from home, wasting your opportunity, wasting your life, wasting everything. You bunch of trust fund babies out here drinking and partying. You have no idea about the real world. You're in this little bubble on Millage Avenue living your best life with no clue. Like that's, you know, that's what's happening in my mind. Like I said, God is, he's working on David. But when I, you know, and, and that's probably, I'm, I mean, I'm probably 90% right. Like that's probably true. I mean, the, the truth is like that, I'm not wrong. I mean, I know a lot of them. I, I'm not wrong, okay? I'm right. But the problem is that this truth doesn't only work one way. It works both ways. Amen. And when that starts rolling over in my spirit and I start getting a bad attitude about that particular group of people, boy, the Holy Spirit comes knocking on my door saying, you don't know them. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know what they deal with. You don't know those boys. Maybe this is an expression of, of some deeper hurt, some, some, some deeper inner struggles that's going. You don't, you don't have a clue. Maybe they're not all like what you think they're all like. So you don't know them, so stop judging them. And I have to repent and go through the whole thing again. I'm like, sorry, Lord, I know. I'm just assuming and judging again. But it works both ways. It doesn't just work toward the poor or toward the underprivileged or disenfranchised. You see the group of Karen's going to your favorite coffee shop. You see, you know who I'm talking about. They all come in in a group, like a flock. They sit in the middle and take up the whole place, and they're so loud. And they're all, they're perfect. 9.30 in the morning, they look, their hair's perfect, makeup's perfect. Ugh. And they come in, and you realize, oh, this is their Bible. They all flop their beautiful, ornate Bibles on the table, and they're having a Bible study. And then you notice they, they, they're, they're cutting their eyes at the homeless man outside the door of the coffee shop. And you start, oh, it just makes me sick. A bunch of Christians with their Bibles open won't even give that guy outside the time of day. Who do they think they are? Holy Spirit says, who do you think you are? You don't know those ladies. Maybe they don't even know what a full night's sleep feels like without being medicated. You have no idea the weight that bears down on them to keep up the appearances that they feel obligated to. You have no idea the stress and the comparison trap that they live in. You have no idea what their life is like. So before you judge them for how they treated the homeless man, be careful with your own soul. So it works both ways. And James says, show no partiality. He said, when we make these distinctions and when we make these preferences, we've moved from a place of mercy to a place of judgment. And this is what he says. I'm going to close with this. In verse 12, he says, so speak and act, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. I don't know about you, but I want to be judged under the law of liberty and grace and mercy. When I stand before God, if it's all of those laws in the Old Testament that I was supposed to keep and I didn't, I am in big trouble. I don't need to be judged on that. I need to be judged on the law of liberty. He says, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown 
no mercy. Do you remember what Jesus taught? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So this is what James is saying. James is saying, if you're going to judge people, he's not actually saying don't ever judge people. He's just saying, if you're going to judge people, you better be perfect. If you're going to cut your eyes and say these things about your brothers and sisters, then if you've, if you've even broken the law in one aspect, you've broken the entire law. So if you're going to judge, you better be perfect. So just want to give you a quick piece of advice. Probably don't want to judge. Because he who has shown mercy will receive mercy. But if you haven't shown mercy, you won't receive it. I, got the, uh, I was, had the privilege of officiating a, a wedding yesterday. It was with Hugo's family. I got to officiate an El Salvadorian wedding, wedding yesterday. And it was beautiful. And so I got there and <clears throat> there's was, there was so much delicious smelling food. I mean, they had, it was like a row of grills. Just, I mean, just in a whole line. And these folks were just, I mean, they're cooking. And it smells so good. I was like, man, can we eat first and then we'll do the wedding? I mean, it's just, they are rocking it. <laughs> but there's these. All these folks are there and they're cooking. You know, it's just a huge celebration. We're getting ready to do the wedding. And I, I, and I, I can't remember, I don't know if I asked Hugo or somebody asked him, but I, they were asking, who's all the people cooking the food? And uh, he said, well, now they're from El Salvador. The people cooking the food were Mexicans. And that's not a racist term. I mean, they're literally from Mexico. And they're not part of their family. They're just there to support this new bride and her family and help her celebrate. They live in Athens, but they're away from their home in Mexico, just like Hugo's family is away from his home in El Salvador. They don't really know them. They just showed up to celebrate. The commonality that they have is they're both away from their home. They have that in common. That's the thing that unifies them. And it just, I just, it was like the Holy Spirit just spoke to me in that moment and struck me so heavy. And the Lord was saying, that's how I want my kids to be. You're all away from home. None of you live, this is not your home. So let the thing you have in common bring you together. And when one rejoices, you all rejoice. And when one weeps, you all weep. And it was such a powerful and a beautiful picture of this thing that James is saying when he says, show no partiality, but let the thing that unites us all. Listen, this is not our home. We're all, we're all in a place we don't belong. But we're united around the cross of Christ. And so no matter your economic status, the color of your skin, your family background and traditions, or your gender, your age. Listen, we have something that unites us that's greater than all of that. It's the blood of Christ. We're all sons and daughters away from home. So what if we circled, it up, circled up and gathered together and we celebrated one another's victory and we, we cried and mourned during loss with one another. Such a powerful picture. Show no partiality. Let the love of Christ guide your heart. Let it pull you into uncomfortable spaces. You'll be amazed at the experiences you'll have. Would you bow your heads? Father, I thank you. God, I'm so glad that you don't call the qualified, that you don't pick the best of, you don't seem to care about superlatives. It seems that in our weakest place, 
you call us. Because where we're weakest, your strength is put on display. And it makes you look so awesome, Jesus. So thank you, God, for your mercy. Thank you. You've given us what we don't deserve. You've set upon us that which we did not earn. You've put a ring on our finger. You've put sandals on our feet and a robe around our shoulders. You've prepared a celebration for us. Even while we were sinners, you sent your son to die for us so that by faith we could become once again kids of the king. Having received such a great salvation through your mercy, God, let it press into our hearts what we've received so that we can extend that to others. Father, I pray anytime, God, that we've, we've moved from the seat of mercy to the seat of judgment. Holy Spirit, convict us. Remind us the words of the words of James that if that's the seat that we're going to operate from, that's the seat we're going to be judged by. So that we would repent and step back into mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let us always, God, my prayer is we would operate out of the mercy we've received. And thank you, Lord, for your mercy toward us. God, I pray for those, for everyone in this room, if there's anyone in here who has not received your mercy, God, I pray today would be their day. Day of coming home. Day of repentance and salvation. Your word says that if we conceal our transgressions against you, we won't prosper. But if we confess them and if we forsake them, then we will obtain your mercy. So God, we have nothing to hide today. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move across the, every heart in this room. If there's anyone in this house this morning who's not walking with Jesus, who doesn't know the love of the Father, you speak to them now. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here this morning, say, Pastor, I need the sure mercies of God in my life. Listen, today God is not asking for you to get your life together. He's not asking for you to shape up or he's not asking you to quit doing this or start doing that. He's just simply saying, come clean. Come home. Come clean. Come home and come clean. He's not a God who judges you harshly. He loves you. He is rich in mercy. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I need to commit my life to Jesus. Would you raise your hand? Anyone here? I need to commit my life to Christ and receive the new mercies of God. Thanks be to God. I see that hand. Anyone else? God bless you. Anyone else? I need to receive God's mercy. I'm so glad to know that he doesn't pick the best, the most talented, the perfect people. This morning, he's choosing you. Will you respond? Anyone else? Amen. Can we stand to our feet this morning? There was one that raised their hand. I want to lead you in a prayer. I want us all to pray. No one praying along. That one that raised their hand, I mean, there may be others. It's just a simple act of faith to, to talk to God and say, God, I, I receive your promises. So would you, would you, church, say this prayer with me? Say, Dear Father, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me and make me new. I receive your mercies and salvation this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for sacrificing yourself for me. I love you, and I will walk with you 
from this day forward. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Can we give God thanks and praise for that one and maybe others who've entered into new life in Christ? Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Well, listen, we're going to dismiss you in just a moment, but I don't ever want to have a service where you don't have a chance to pray, to bring things before the Lord at the altar. So if you would like to come forward and pray, if you've got situations in your life that, that you need prayer with somebody, I want to invite you to come down. They're going to lead us in a song. Feel free to stay and worship, and I want to invite you to come down and pray.